Joey Boy has returned and the rhythm of his drums of liberation has suddenly awoken the iron giant that once assaulted Marie Joie. This opens up endless possibilities, but the implications of this robot reacting to Joy Boy, much like Zunisha did, and the true nature of the drums of liberation itself, opens up certain revelations that might even provide yet another key clue towards piecing together the puzzle of the One Piece treasure. So strap along! But before that, well, I already mentioned this in last week's video, in case you missed it, I want I wanted to present you my latest project, the Library of Ahara Gold Plush. I teamed up with Makeship to create a plushie that would be emblematic of this beautiful world, rich with detail from all the iconic places from the story, ranging from things like All of His Blue to a fluffy Skypea, Long Ring Long Land, Sabaudi, Tequila Wolf, Zoe, Toddland, Egghead, and so much more to look for. I worked closely with Makeship for several months, carefully referencing the original sketches to ensure that this globe could be as closely accurate to canon as possible, making it the perfect gift for yourself or any fan. The plush is available to order on makeship.com for $29.99 with a flat shipping rate of only 9 bucks, shipping anywhere in the world no matter where you are. However, this plush will only be available to order for the next 3 weeks and after that it will be gone forever. So if you want this, don't wait and make sure to order yours right now. Once again, find the link in the description below to get your very own Library of Ohara Globe. So before the Iron Giant, we have to contend with another type of Iron Fellow, being Akuma arriving at Marijua, only to be stopped by Sakazuki in an incredible showing of the Fleet Admiral actually leaving his office for the first time in a decade. Kuma having climbed to the top of the red line, though, makes this for a very interesting parallel, especially within this chapter, because it mirrors the story of the Iron Giant who, 200 years ago, climbed the red line to attack Marijua, but ran out of power before he could cause any damage and collapse right then and there. The Iron Giant serves as a big point of question across this entire chapter, as Vigabung explained how the robot appears to be autonomous without needing a pilot inside, and was instead powered by a power source the Ancient Kingdom had discovered, which Vigabung believed to be available across the whole world. Interestingly, Robin also brought up how around the time of the Iron Giant incident 200 years ago was also the period when the government decided to let Fishman Island join the world government and attempted to lessen the discrimination against sea folk. Was this simply a reaction of the the government wanting to amass more allies, or could it perhaps be actually connected? Is the fact that the Iron Giant wears a mask identical to that of a fisherman like Jack just a coincidence, or is there more to it? And beyond all that, what was the Iron Giant doing in Marjoa? Maybe it recognized the government as its enemy, but unless the robot is smart enough to deduce that on its own, it shouldn't know it as Marie did not even exist 900 years ago when the Iron Giant was built and programmed. Rather, it's likely that it originally existed to protect what laid before Marie being the technologically advanced god country, the settlement of the genetically enhanced Lunaria who came from the moon, and it likely attacked Marie to drive away the intruders from its homeland. But regardless, the connection between Kuma and the Iron Giant hardly feels like a coincidence, as not only does the Iron Giant become relevant again in this chapter, but the moment that Kuma first left Kamabaka and started flying towards Marijoa was literally the same exact chapter that the Iron Giant was properly introduced and when Luffy was first interacting with it, so no doubt Oda is bringing attention to this parallel. Could the two events somehow be connected? Two giant robots capable of moving on their own despite technically not having a will of their own or emotions, climbing to the heavens where the god country once stood? At the very least, Kuma's intention appeared to be different than the Iron Giants, as his final destination appears to be somewhere in the New World, only having climbed to Marijua as his powers did not let him cross over the Red Line. Keep in mind that this also took place yesterday, so Kuma should be bound to arrive at his destination fairly soon. At this point, everything just seems to point to that destination being Egghead, but it once again makes us wonder, what is Kuma after and what reactivated him? Was it somehow Bunny, or perhaps maybe even the robot or Joy Boy directly? His connection with Bunny is certainly interesting, as we even get a flashback of when Sakazuki found Bunny after her encounter with Blackbeard, explaining how Kuma died. During that scene, Sakazuki also mentioned back in the day how worried he had been that Bunny escaped the government, which brings into question again just what exactly their purpose with her was. Both Luchi and Saturn mentioned that her use had ended. Does it have to do with her powers, wanting to alter the age of something, or maybe something even related with Kuma? Meanwhile, at Egghead, we finally have Luffy clashing with Kizaru. 
This is highlighted by a very iconic quote, where Luffy states that now they are a hundred times stronger than they were in Sabaody. This is reference to the fact that in Sabaody, Shaki had stated that Rayleigh was a hundred times stronger than the Straw Hats, and after all, Rayleigh was the one who saved them by being able to go to Toto against Kizaru for a while. So in this case, Luffy being able to clash against Kizaru is a neat reference to him being able to stop Kizaru now in much the same way that Rayleigh did back then. Kizaru in turn responds by saying, very bad manners. More specifically in Japanese, this is the first time that Kizaru has started speaking in a more curt and fast manner. As you may know, in Japanese, Kizaru often speaks very slowly, dragging out the end of his sentences and speaking very casually, you know, kind of like, kawaii ne, but as he enters the lava phase here, he begins speaking more briefly, like, kawaii ne. Personally, thinking this could be a result of him having had to take down Sentomaru and not being in a good mood, being frustrated that this mission has to drag on further than it is intended. However, by the time Kizaru and Luffy fight in this chapter, he begins dragging his sentence again, showing that, at least in my impression, he feels more in control once again. It's also interesting how Kizaru is familiar with Bonnie, which makes sense as his familiarity with Vegapunk and Sentomaru means that he was likely familiar with Kuma and his daughter too, which makes the whole dynamic dynamic of Kizaru, Sentomaru, and Kumatsabaodi all the more fascinating in retrospect. Bonnie tries attacking Kizaru with an attack called Toshitsuki, which reads with the kanji for deadly thrust, but is a pun of the Japanese expression Toshitsuki, which refers to the passing of time over the years. Kizaru, however, ends up kicking Bonnie into the Frontier Dome, destroying the Vega Force, and makes it all the way to Stella, ready to complete his mission, but gets stopped by Luffy, who enters in year 5 in time to take hold of him. But all of a sudden, Hearing the rhythm of the drums of liberation, the Iron Giant awakens. It's very clear by the layout of these panels that the drums of liberation are what awakens the Iron Giant, with the sound effect for the drums of liberation being overlaid over the giant as it wakes up. This brings up as to why it wasn't woken up when Luffy and Luchi were fighting last time. Maybe the fact that he's bigger now makes the sound of the drums of liberation run farther, or realistically the most logical answer is that as Luffy mentions, he fell all the way down to the Fabio face after being fried by the Frontier Dome, and had to climb back up using Gear 5th, so it's possible that he fell, transformed in front of the Iron Giant, resulting in it beginning to activate. But regardless, not only will the Iron Giant help in turning the tables during the Egghead incident, helping the Straw Hats escape in the place of the Vega Force 1, but the implications of the Drums of Liberation being what awakens the Iron Giant of the Void Century are already massive on their own, but this actually may be even bigger deal than you might first think. There is one point of contention that we need to think about first, and that is the fact of if the Drums of Liberation are the actual power source of the Iron Giant, or simply something that is waking it up. It's still possible that the Iron Iron Giant is powered by a separate source, the eternal energy Vegapunk spoke of, and simply reacted to the presence of Joy Boy from the Drums of Liberation. Personally, I'm still of the speculation that the infinite energy source found all around the world could be the energy of the sun itself, but simply woke up due to recognizing Joy Boy or the rhythm. Perhaps given the parallels with Kuma, it even kind of works like a pacifista authority chip, as given the importance of the figure of Joy Boy in the Ancient Kingdom, perhaps a robot like this one would only listen to someone like Joy Boy and thus react to the drums of liberation as the signal of its commander, the complete opposite of Kuma right now, for example, to try that parallel. This is fairly similar to Zunisha, who could only obey in authority to Momonosuke, literally not obeying to anyone else and asking Momonosuke for orders as it otherwise could not obey him, and largely ignored Luffy during all of Zo and Wano, never speaking to him, until he awakened, with Zunisha having a similar reaction to the drums of liberation as the Iron Giant, even sporing the same glowing eyes. But alternatively, maybe it is the rhythm of the Drums of Liberation that fuels it and music was the power source of the Ancient Kingdom. At the very least, we can conclude that when the giant woke up 200 years ago, it wasn't woke up by Joy Boy's actual heartbeat, as the Gorsei mentioned how the Nika fruit has not awakened in the past 800 years. This would corroborate the idea that the drums aren't its power source, just simply something it's reacting to, but it could also be possible that someone played the rhythm of the drums to wake it up rather than hearing the specific heartbeat. But why is all of this important? Well, for that we need to ask ourselves, what exactly are the drums of liberation? 
We know they are music, the music of a party as would indicate in the panel of the party Skypea, but could they be of a song we already know? Dondo Toto, you can realize it has a very similar rhythmic pattern to Yo Ho Ho Ho, the rhythm of Bing Sasake four notes. But sure, sure, you might just say that it's just a big stretch, it's just a coincidence, but once you start thinking about it, it really isn't. Because after all, why would Luffy start chanting literal lyrics word by word from Bing Sasake when transformed in Gear 5th? Because Joy Boy is undoubtedly connected with Bing Sasaki itself. I mean, after all, even the song's lyrics mention the laugh tale of Joy Boy, bringing that all of these, the One Piece treasure, Bing Sasaki, and Joy Boy are all somehow tied together. So, in other words, if the drums of liberation are the rhythm of Bing Sasaki, the rhythm of Joy Boy incarnate, then the implications of it being able to power the ancient Iron Giant could be massive. Maybe it just reacted like Zunisha did to the appearance of its leader or a familiar nostalgic tone, but what if maybe, j just maybe, the rhythm of Bing Sasaki itself is what is powering the ancient giant? Could that mean that the power source of the ancient kingdom could actually be none other than Bing Sasaki? And if my idea that Bing Sasaki could be the One Piece treasure itself that I talked about before could potentially be true, then suddenly the idea of the One Piece helping connect the entire world together in prosperity and unity would not just be symbolically speaking, but could perhaps be very literal. But we still lack too many details, we still can't say for sure, but more than anything we need to understand, what exactly is the connection between Joy Boy and Bing Sasaki? They are obviously intrinsically connected, but how? Well, I hope to get the chance to share my thoughts on that very, very soon. But no doubt, this creature, the Iron Giant from the Void Century, will bring out answers of his own right very, very soon. <laughs>